want us to read. I'll read out loud, and if you have your Bible, the seventh chapter of Matthew, beginning at verse 13, I want to speak tonight on this truth that the people who get on the broad road and build their houses on sand and something comes along and tears it up because the house wasn't built on the right foundation. These people who call him Lord but do not know him and do not do his will They get on that broad road by listening to false prophets. By listening to false prophets. Follow me now as we read the whole passage one more time. The Lord says in verse 13, Enter ye in at the straight gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Beware false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Ye shall know them by their fruits. Then he argues, do men gather grapes of thorns? No. Or figs of thistles? Of course not. Even so, here is something that makes good sense. Every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. It's an impossibility, he said. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit. And a corrupt tree cannot bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by thy fruits you shall know them, these false prophets. It is my conviction, not mine alone, that our task these days is threefold in the public proclamation of the word. We must proclaim and enforce God's holy law. We must proclaim in all of its purity God's holy gospel. And we must lift up our voices and call to the people's attention the Savior's plain admonition to beware of false prophets. Let me call your attention one more time as I have somewhere along the line since I've been here that a false prophet is not necessarily an evil prophet. In the Old Testament especially and in the New, they're evil prophets, they're malicious, they're satanically inspired. But a false prophet may be a fine fellow He comes to you in sheep's clothing. But the fact that he's such a nice fellow and he's so earnest and he's so sincere and he seems to have such a passion for souls and seems to want to see people saved so intensely makes him all the more dangerous because the people will hear him and they'll hear him as he preaches a message that doesn't bear good fruit good fruit. I don't care how nice a man is if his message doesn't produce good fruit. He's a false prophet. And the Lord tells the people to beware of false prophets. And he tells them how they can tell a false prophet by the fruit that results from the ministry of that Sunday school teacher or that fellow preaches on the street or that fellow preaches over the radio or from the pulpit stand here or wherever or however it may be if his converts are not good if his converts do not spend the rest of their life as callers and seekers on the Lord if his converts 
go to hell because they're depending on some physical act they perform or some prayer that they said or something like that. Well, beware of false prophets. I heard a preacher today over the radio telling the sinner to pray the sinner's prayer and he'd guarantee he'd be saved. Now that's blaspheming. And it's the lips comes from the lips of a false prophet. Maybe a nice fellow. And he's very sincere, but he knows nothing about the way God brings sinners to himself. And it's time now in the battle of words and in the conflict of doctrine and a Especially since you and I have lived all the days of our life when the fruit has not been very good. And we have to, uh, we have to dig ourselves considerably to find the slightest evidence that we have a saving interest in the blood of Christ and that we are truly married to and and united to the Lord Jesus Christ. The scriptures tell us that we are a branch if we are a child of God. And the sap and the juice and the power and the life comes from the vine. And we'll look at ourselves in these days when we can almost hear the death rattle of real Christianity. And it's hard put we are have the slightest evidence in ourselves that there's any power flowing to us from the vine and then through us to lost mankind. This is desperate language. And certainly this is the time for us to pick up our ears and beware of false prophets and to search our own experience and our own convictions in our own standing and condition, see whether or not we are on this broad road. That's the road of religious profession, where everybody on it calls Jesus Lord, where even some on it do some tremendous, mighty words, cast out demons and so forth. And where... <clears throat> Now we're living in a time when our houses are being built down and so many people are discovering that they have strong faith but they had their faith in the wrong person or the wrong thing. And where the winds from a thousand directions are blowing and the confidences and assurances of multitudes of people that they were built on a rock has long since gone by the board as they found their whole spiritual structure blown away. And here we are. Here we are. Here we are. They were false prophets. Now, <clears throat> it's, it's not to be just sneered at that right after our Lord has so seriously enjoined us and admonished us to strive to get in the straight gate, thus walk the narrow road, and has told us that there is a wide gate, and that it leads to a broad way, and that this broad way leads to destruction, eternal destruction, and that the narrow gate Lead the, wide, the straight gate leads to a very narrow way and that that narrow way and that narrow way alone leads to life. It's not to be just passed over that in the next very breath, in the next very verse, the Lord brings up the subject of us being keenly on the alert to see to it whether we believe a lie or whether we believe truth. For if you believe the devil's lie, you can't be saved. And if you do not prick up your ears, you'll be like the folks who listen to the radio today. They believe everything they hear, and thus they believe nothing. Thus they believe nothing. Oh, beware of false prophets. We need to heed that warning, especially today. For I'm not an old crank when I tell you. You living in the day of a mighty low ebb of spiritual power. The 
deadness on our faces, the blank look on your faces, is a mark of death. We seem to be numbed or cocaine until all expression is gone from us. Looks like we're in the gasping time of the death rattle of what we call spiritual life. I'm telling you the truth, folks. We're in a desperate state. And the preacher knows it and feels it and would do you good. I would ask you, you who people who do not even bring your Bible when you come to preach, do you expect what, what on earth has happened to us, folks? The people in Berea were wise. They searched to see what was it they heard was in the scripture. Was in the scripture. When I come back down to my native Southland, I go north a lot. I can always tell if I've come down below the Mason Dixon line. And I'd be dead certain I'd come home into a Baptist church if I preached to Bibleist people. Bibleist people. In the north, they've had to fight for the gospel. And the people in the north that believe in the Lord, they believe in him. They believe in him, brother. They stick out, brother. They're in the minority, but they stick out. And, brother, they are Bible readers and Bible students. If the scripture is true that my Lord said my sheep listen to my voice. I can't hear it except out of here. That's how you hear it. Then I tell you our Bible-lessness is a mark of something that's terribly, terribly bad. You mad at me? I wish you had more interest in your soul. I really do. I wish I could get under your high and jar you out of this state of death that we seem to all be in and that the Holy Spirit would spur somebody to the day of not absolutely measuring everything you hear now. Not for what Ralph Barnett says, but what the Word of God says. For there's the truth. And I wish we believed it. Beware of false prophets. Beware of false prophets. We cannot escape the inference here, and I think it's more than an inference that the Lord is saying, beware of false prophets. He wants us to wake up to the fact that the way people get on this broad road is because they listen to false prophets. Not bad men, but men who did not preach the truth. Or they preached it in half truths and a half truth worse than a whole era because people will swallow it hook, line, and sinker and that's terribly dangerous. I want tonight to mention from the word of God five marks of false preaching that are peculiar to the hour in which we live and these marks by which Men and women who really have an interest in eternity and labor under the suspicion that it's entirely possible we're not just a bunch of hogs or dogs and that when we die they'll take us out here and bury us so we won't corrupt the air with our rotting bodies and that's the last of us but that has men and women who have some, some belief at least that, that out yonder there's another life 
and that these days down here, what happens here, will determine what will happen out yonder. I think it's, it's, it is conspicuously true today that these five things uh, are worthy of our close attention. I do not dare to take time enough to mention many, many of the marks of a false prophet that dot the pages of the Old Testament and the New. But I pick out five that seem to me, and I believe I'm about half right here, to be peculiar to the preaching of this age that has got us in this awful death-like state we're in where it seems that we're powerless to pray, that we have no hunger for the Word of God, that we're just uh, about half dead and dragging along and hoping for the best. And I mentioned these five marks. The Lord said you can tell these false prophets by their fruit, by their fruit. And as I look about the fruit of our ministries for these 30, 40, 50 years, and the fruit's getting worse all the time, and the standards are going down all the time, and the marks of death are growing all the while, and the, the marks of life seem to be almost disappearing. I think these five things really maybe picture the type of preaching that we've had for these many years that have got us on this broad road that's leading multitudes of people who are sincere. They're dead, but they're sincere. They're lifeless, but they believe what they've been told, and they're on the broad road, and they think they're all right, and only an awakening of the Holy Ghost will ever awaken them. And they'll go to hell and be greatly surprised because they thought they were all right. The first of these marks that I think is peculiar to the hour in which we live is that a false preacher will speak peace to a sinner when God hasn't spoken peace. The Old Testament talks about men who speak peace, peace, when there is no peace. One of the pastors in a, I don't know if it's in this county or not, Brother Wallace Starr slipped up to me the other night when he's in the services, and he says, I have a deep conviction that we've made decisions for multitudes of people these days. We've made decisions for people. Have you ever run across this? Have you run across this? Yes, a personal worker. And they are very earnest and very sincere. And they got an old unsaved man lined up and they're trying their best to help him. And they'll say, now, my brother, uh, let's read this verse of Scripture. All right. And we'll read it. Do you believe that? Yes, I believe that. Well, what does that say? Well, it says so-and-so, so-and-so. Well, you believe? Oh, yes. Well, now, God wouldn't lie, would he? Oh, no, I don't believe God would lie. Well, then, according to what that verse of Scripture says, you do so and so, God will save you. Yes, that's what it says. Well, now, God wouldn't lie, would he? All right, well, then, aren't you saved? Well, I don't know. Well, well, you wouldn't call God a liar, would you? No, no. Why, of course you are saved. And so we decide that that old boy is saved for him. We decide that he's saved for him. I was down in Texas week before this last speaking to young pastors, and one one day after the noonday message, the 11 o'clock message, where a few of us were seated having a bite to eat, and some of the younger pastors were greatly disturbed over something I said, and you better listen to Brother Barnett right now. Some of you don't even do as much as go around inviting people to accept Christ. But I called attention to the fact that in the New Testament, when you went and knocked in somebody's door and you went to talk to a man who wasn't lost, we had just one weapon, and that was the proclamation of truth to him. That's right. I'm telling you that God's truth, we fill hell full of church members and our churches full. How many of you have accepted a proposition instead of submitting to the Lord Jesus Christ? 
And I call that attention to this fact. And I'm speaking to Sunday school teachers now. And I'm speaking to you precious young deacons who have a tremendous responsibility. And I bet you better hear me. We have literally, literally substituted the winsomeness of our personality and the power of our appeal for the one thing that's got any power in it. Romans 1, 16 says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power of God unto selves. Let me illustrate what I'm talking about. I know this is Monday night crowd. This is indicative of how far we are from the blessing of God. But you are here, and I'd be helpful to you if I could. I rejoice in it with good crowds and do my best with small. That's God's business. I've been telling you we're dying, but you are here. Let me give you an illustration. God had to come to a fellow by the name of the Apostle Peter and nearly kill him before he could get rid of his tradition and his Jewish prejudice. And finally, he sent old Peter down to a fellow named Cornelius who was down there and praying and worshiping God best he knew how. And he just hoping somebody would come and speak to him the words of salvation. And after God nearly had to kill old Peter to get him to go down there, hear me now. The apostle Peter went down there and knocked on the door. Come in. I'm apostle Peter. Are you this man Cornelius? Yes. Well, I want to know, brother Cornelius, you won't accept Jesus as your personal Savior. No, he didn't do no such thing. There ain't no power in your little old invitation. And there's not a bit of power in that man's decision. But I'll tell you what, there is power. There's power in the gospel. You know what Peter did? He preached the gospel to him. He preached the gospel to him. He preached the gospel to him. I'm telling you, for the last 40 and 60 years, church members didn't know the gospel themselves, and when they went out and did personal work, they didn't give the sinner a bit of truth. They just took out their hand and said, Brother, won't you accept Jesus? And the old boy did and went on to hell. But listen, listen, there isn't any power except in the gospel. And if you get a chance to witness to a man, what are you going to tell him? Do what Peter did. Give him the truth of God in Jesus Christ. And the scripture tells us there in the 10th chapter of Acts, you read it, I'm not making this up. While yet Peter yet spake unto them, the Holy Ghost fell on them that heard the word, and they got saved. Of course they did. That's how people get saved. Not by your little old two-bit argument. Not by your little old invitation. That isn't worth a dime. They just accept the proposition and go on to hell believing they're all right. It's the gospel. It's the power of God and the salvation. I'm pleading that we, we quit all this foolishness and get us a Bible and go out here and represent Christ instead of disgracing him. And when we tackle a sinner, do what they did in Bible times, give him the word. And if the Holy Ghost falls on it, he'll be saved while he's listening. But he won't be saved just by you asking him he won't accept Jesus. Most of you folks are going to split hell wide open because all on God's earth you got. You accepted a proposition somebody made one night. But there's no salvation in my proposition. The gospel is the power of God. The gospel. Repent and believe the gospel. And we've spoken peace. And these young preachers were disturbed. They mean, see, they said, you mean tell me when we go out to do personal work, we ought to just give them the word of God? I say, exactly right. And pray the Holy Ghost will fall on them while they listen if the devil is saved. Amen. You can't improve. I know we've been trying to. But see, that's the one thing we don't do. When we go out and do a little personal work, we don't give them the gospel. We just give them our little invitation. And they've already accepted it. And all they did is accept our invitation. And we told them, there's all right. We spoke peace when there wasn't any peace. Here, Brother Barnett, one more time. Between eternity, between heaven and hell, there is only one voice. It's 
that's been given the authority and the power and the ability to speak peace to a troubled soul. And that's the voice of God. If that old sinner has to have you convince him he's saved, you're butchering him. Mr. Finney used to say, many went away saying they'd been comforted by the Holy Ghost. And if he gives you comfort, if he fills your heart with peace, that's fine. But if you got your hope of going to heaven because you accepted my proposition or somebody else's plea to receive Christ, I'm scared to death that you're going to find you've built your house on sand and you've been walking in a broad road and it leads to destruction. Another mark of a false prophet that's closely akin to this one, the Old Testament speaks of men healing the wounds of people slightly. This is what I miss and what I keep preaching. I go from place to place, and one time I see glorious things, and another time deadness. But I, I can't do it myself, and so we just keep on and keep on and keep on. But I refuse. I've done it for thirty odd years. I've won. I've seen more. Multiplied, multiplied, multiplied thousands of people make profession of faith. I won't know whether any of them got saved till I get to the judgment. I hope many of them did. But I've never done one thing, and so help me, God, I never will. I may rob a bank tomorrow, but I'll never stoop to these underhanded methods to get people to say they accept Jesus if they do not want him mighty bad. I'm telling you what's the fact. These dry eyed walk in the aisle and switching you jump from one jaw to the other and going right back out. I've actually seen men get converted, they claim they did in the service at the old mourners beach and go right back out and light a cigarette. I've seen. I've seen. Why, there ain't no more salvation to that than a monkey, and you know. You see, their salvation didn't even clean them up. That's no good. That's no good. And you know it's no good. Oh, healing the wounds. Slightly. With the exception of John the Baptist who was filled with the Spirit in his mother's womb. And Jeremiah, likewise. I'm on pretty safe ground when I tell you that in order to save a human being, the lovely Lord Jesus has to wound. And the preacher that will heal the wounds that blood-stained Jesus gives a sinner in order to bring him to himself is a false priest. We have a generation of people now who say they have peace, but they never knew bitterness. And they scare me. They scare me to death. God bless you, my lovely Lord. In order to conquer an old rebel, to crush him, to where he'll bow to his blessed rule, my Lord is kind enough to wound sinners, get them down off that cockiness, humble them, break them, and God help the man puts a little cold cream on a weeping sinner. Let God give them joy. He's the one can give them real joy. In times when I've seen a little of what we call revival, just a little bit, I have thought sometimes my old heart would break as I've seen men and women suffering 
under the wounds of him who loves sinners enough, rather than see him to go to hell, he'll wound them, and he'll wound them deeply. If he don't, they'll never call. If we do not believe it, but it's so, a sinner will never call on the Lord if he can help it. God and wounds. Don't heal the wounds of sinners slightly. Don't do it. Don't do it. Let the one who inflicts the wound, and if the Lord don't wound you, you go into hell, I'll tell you that. Let him that inflicts you. You just keep your hand off on it. I have people come to, oh, look at that. Isn't she suffering? Look how she's weeping. Down in Texas in July, a little junior girl, about 10, 11, 12, maybe 13 years old. And she'd come, every, she'd come, got to coming to the front. And, and she'd kneel there. And you could almost hear the rack of her body as her body was racked with sorrow. Just a little 13 year old girl. And the mother came to me one day and she said, Brother Barnes, look how she suffered. I said, Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. The wounds of my blessed Lord go mighty deep. They have to wound your brother or you'll go to hell. Don't heal the wounds of sinners like false prophets do that. Don't speak peace. Let God speak peace. Don't tell a man God's done something from him for him. Let the man tell you what God's done. You can't beat the Holy Spirit for doing what God Almighty gave him to do. In the third place, false prophets in these days, good men, make the gate a whole lot easier to get in than the Lord did. It is so hard to get in this straight gate, my Lord said you had to agonize to do it. You had to agonize. Oh, my soul. How easy it's made now. How easy. But nobody that loves you will tell you it's easy. When I was a student in one of our seminaries in Texas many, many years ago, my withered mother up in the plains of Texas went to a doctor and the diagnosis scared her. Scared her so that she got on train, came down to Fort Worth, Texas, where I was going to school told me what to say. There happened to be visiting as a doctor in the hospital in Fort Worth, one of the staff of uh, the great Mayo brothers in Rochester, Minnesota. And I went to the president of the school and he got me an appointment to see that great surgeon. And I took my mother to see him. And he examined her over a period of few days and told her she had cancer. Cancer of the womb. And he told her that he believed there was a 50-50 chance if they removed the womb that she'd have many years of life. And I didn't have any money. I was going to school. A great, he was a gentleman. I told him about my condition. He said, 
said, it's all right. Do the best you can. He took my mother. My mother asked me to go in the operating room, and I stood there for three hours and 37 minutes doing that awful long operation. My mother had asked me that if she came out of it alive, that I'd be at her bedside when she woke up and I was there. And when she woke up and got her wits about it, the first question she asked, Is it out? And I said, Yes, Mother. She said, I'm so glad. Oh, I've been so glad she lived 37 years after that. No recurrence. Isn't it wonderful that that doctor told her the truth? What if that doctor said, Now, there's a little something wrong in there, and I'm going to give you this little nice little bunch of pills, and I think you've taken it twice a day, I think of the hunky door. No, he told her she had cancer. He told her she had cancer. And that only, and only it, it'd kill her eventually unless it was taken out, and he, of course, being human, couldn't guarantee that. My mother said, I'm so glad, so glad. Suppose, my friends, that Jesus told the truth. Just, just suppose. Just suppose he said this gate is visit. It's not a little skin disease. There's a cancer in that has got to come out. That's that old wicked hostility in your heart. It's got to be crushed, and you've got to be made a captive and a willing captive of bloodstained Jesus. With his will central in your life, and nothing but an operation of the Holy Ghost and the power of the blood of Christ and the risen Lord is sufficient for your need. Suppose he told the truth. What in the name of God will this generation of easy go and sin for living men and women claiming to be children of God? How will the fair one the stand of the judge having ignored this admonition of the Lord? Strive to get in the straight gate. It's the difficult. You can't have this world in Christ too. One of them got to go. You can't have the spirit of this age in Christ too. One of them got to go. You can't have all this in heaven too. One of them got to go. You know, it may be he told the truth. I'm betting that he did. And I say to you that a false prophet will preach this little easy gospel. You can keep your sins and do as you please. Now, once in a while, you can get up in the church and say, Now, I'm saved, but I haven't been living right. And that'll make you feel better for a couple of weeks, and that's why you'll die and go on to hell. Ladies and gentlemen, this thing is pretty serious. This game is difficult. And the false prophet tell you it's easy. What are the marks of a false prophet in this day that make this robe a whole lot broader than Jesus makes? A whole lot broader than the, You know, Dylan, I know there are winter times in the soul. I know there are times when life seems to flow more than others. But I also know that this generation then shot a curve when I keep hearing people telling me I know I'm saved, but I'm not living for the Lord. Something wrong. This narrow way hadn't got room on it for men and women in rebellion against Jesus Christ. Hear me? This narrow way is a Christ discipline with us. And I tell you now that I do you good, not evil at all. You better bring your habits and your thoughts and your work and your home and 
and your body and everything there is about you to praise. Put them under his discipline, brother. Too long we've had a generation of church people that decide what they'll do and what they will not do. I tell you, it's not given to us to walk this narrow road except under the discipline of the Lord. No! That'll call for daily repentance. That'll call for daily exercise of faith. That'll call for daily surrender and commitment. God bless your heart. That'll call for daily getting your orders from the commander-in-chief. It's your will, dear one. But I'm telling you, we know nothing much about what I'm talking about now. My heart leaps within me, lest we miss Christ altogether. This discipline role. See, it's discipline not by what we claim, but by what we do. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter in the kingdom of heaven. Who else? He that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Not so to talk about I'm saved, but I'm not living right. But he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. That's what the Lord says. That's what the Lord Oh, I'm saved, Brother Barnes, but I'm not doing the will of God. Well, if that's so, the Lord Jesus is alive. Because he said the fellow that's going to make it is the fellow that does the will of his Father. Now, I can't do anything perfectly, but there's something I can do. Amen. You need to worry about perfection yet. But my Lord said, not everyone that saith, they're on that broad road. Oh, just look at us. They're not the ones, but he that doeth, present tense, partnership, that's the tenor of his life. That's the bent of his life, the will of God. That's the biggest thing in his life. That's the man who saves. That's the child of God. That's the the Lord identifies as a fellow that's not on this broad road. He's on the narrow road. It's narrow because it's under the strict discipline. Here. Who earned the right to demand of us that we bring our very thoughts into captivity unto you. Things, whoever we do, do everything we do to the glory of the Lord. But the false prophet, his converts, oh, I'm saved, but the will of God's not the central thing that makes you tick. And there's no salvation there, devil, if Jesus told the truth. The last word about a false prophet is this. Not only does he speak peace where there is no peace, this is peculiar to our day and heal the wounds of men lightly. Not only does he make the gate for the ease instead of difficult and the road very broad instead of narrow, but he offers salvation on cheaper terms than God does. The terms have never been changed. Any human being on earth is able to repent. But you see, repentance isn't a once-for-all act. It goes on as long as you live. And anybody on earth that's able to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, but that's not a once-for-all act. It goes on as long as you live. Anybody on earth that can meet the terms of salvation, repentance, and faith, thank 
God is the same. Praise God. But they will not be lowered. They cannot be cheapened. And repentance is nothing more or less than the dethronement of you and the enthronement of God's Son in here. And faith is nothing more or less than utter confidence in and absolute obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ. But what we've known all the days I've been a preacher, you just go through some motions one time. Preacher tells you you're saved and go on to hell. No, no. Every commitment between you and God needs to be made time after time after time after time after time. I know what I'm talking about. It's he that believes that. He just keeps on believing. It's he that endureth. He don't play out. He don't run for a little while and then stop. No, no. It's he that abideth. It's he that drinketh. It's he that obeyeth. It's he that eateth. All of these, you school children know the meaning of them. It's continuous. We walk by faith. Every day calls for new commitment to the utter lordship of Christ in your life. Utter dependence on his saving blood to wipe out the penalty of sin that God Almighty demands. And to make it cheaper than that is the mark of a false prophet, not of truth. Utter dethrone of the self. Utter in throne of the Christ, Christ where you be, Christ giving the orders, Christ in command, that's repentance. And I'm going to look in the face now, I'll meet you to judge anybody on earth that take this book and face it and find out what's in it. Be faced with the totalitarian claims of God for His Son in your life. Anybody on earth will do it. Will either curse God and hope to die, or it'll bring you to deep repentance every day of your life. For the best saint that ever lived, when he faced with the all inclusiveness of God's commands for his son will have to just continually face the fact that you fall so far short. So far short. We're commanded to bring our thoughts into captivity to him. Now, brother, that's kind of a job. How many of you bat a thousand percent? You see, his demands, his claims of his rule in your daily living, it, it doesn't cause you to have tremendous experiences of repentance and crying to God for forgiveness and confession of sin. It's because you know nothing of Christ. You're a stranger to the Son of God. Holy McCain said, Christ's war is to be preferred to the devil's peace. And if Christ is in here, he'll disturb you till the day you die. If he's in there. 
If he's not in there, if he's just a profession to you, if he's just somebody you hope will keep you out of hell and leave you alone while you live, you'll never know what I'm talking about. You'll not know anything about disturbance, you see. But if Christ is in you, he's holy. And he'll disturb you. And you'll know what it is to cry for forgiveness every day, brother. You'll know what it is to pour out your heart about your sins. The reason you don't think you're a big sinner is because Christ isn't in there. You see, Christ isn't in there. What's the awful price you pay for listening to false preachers? You'll show up at the judgment. In that day, my Lord said, I'm quoting from this passage of Scripture, and I'm through. In that day, many shall say unto me, Lord, Lord, they're on this broad road. They got there listening to these false preachers. Many shall say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, you about to make a mistake, have we not in thy name? Just look what we've done. Well, that's fine. There's one little thing wrong with it. They did it. He never had done anything for them. Look at us! Lord, Lord! Just look at us. In thy name we've done many wonderful things. In thy name we've prophesied. In thy name we've cast out demons. And then the Lord shall look at them and say, Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never at any time knew you. That's the price people will pay for listening to false preachers, going through a wide gate of easy believism, walking a broad road that doesn't bring you under Christ's discipline every blessed day of your life. That's the price the youngsters writing notes while the preacher preaches will pay. So help me God at the judgment. That's right. I never knew. My Lord said, Beware. stand together. Ron is going to lead us in, or Donnie, I believe it is, going to lead us in our song number 230.